Welcome to the Fearless Sellers, the Women of Amazon podcast. I'm Joey Roberts. You know me. Uh, I think most people say I'm, I've got quite. I'm quite resilient, um, and uh, I think uh, I had a real belief in what I was doing, and I really believed in my product, and I really believed that it was going to make a difference to people. Um, and the feedback I started getting, I mean, I know Amazon sellers are normally very obsessed with getting reviews, but actually when you're doing something like that, the reviews are important, not only in terms of like the positive stuff, but also the negative, because you want to know well, like, what's working, what's not working, what do I need to tweak? What, what do I need to change? Um, but overall the, 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 um, the feedback was hugely positive. Like this was a product that people needed. Today, we have Cara Sayer on the Fearless Sellers podcast. Cara is joining us all the way from London. She's an inventor, an Amazon seller, and an all-around amazing woman. Cara, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very flattered from that lovely introduction. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, I am so... What'd you say? I said right back at you. Oh, that's so sweet. All right. Well, let's jump in. So I just said you're living in London. And you have a daughter, Holly, that is a teenager now? She is a a lovely teenager. I was going to say a terrible teenager, but she's a lovely teenager. I'm very lucky at the moment, she says, touching wood everywhere. Uh, She's 15. Oh, wow. 15. Okay, so what is it like to have a teenager but still be talking about baby products? Frankly, it's a bit weird. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm actually not a baby person either. So I don't really, I'm not that I don't like babies. <laughs> I like, I just don't like all babies. You know how some people just love babies, give them a baby, they're in heaven. I've never been like that. I've always like, I like a baby if I like the baby. Like if the baby has an attitude or the baby's got a bit of something about them, or sometimes if they are just really cute. Um, but it's not always just about like, oh, it's a baby. I love it. But, but I love, uh, obviously my product is a baby product. Um, and I, what I think I love more than the babies is I actually just love helping the parents because I can still remember because I'm, I'm a sleep deprived teenage parent rather than a sleep deprived baby parent, um, what that feels like. And, um, so I think that's what I really enjoy is, um, helping parents kind of getting out and about and doing their thing and having a better life basically. So let's go back to when Holly was a baby. You encountered a problem that you solved way back then. That must have been like 2009, 2010. I'm trying to do the math. Before, yeah, before, before that. Like- so Holly was born in 2007, October 2007. Oh. So I know that I uh, had registered the domain name for my business at the end of December 2008. So within a sort of, uh, well, 15 month gap i'd obviously because i can't remember the exact timeline i just had a baby (laughs) um and um so uh i i know i registered the domain name in december 2008 so i know i did that much and then i uh, launched the business at the end of 2009 as in i registered it and i'd attended a trade show in the october of 2009 and then the products went live in kind of february march 2010 so it was a that sort of a a timeline so i know that i probably kind of came up with the concept probably around like anything from March, April, 2008 to kind of obviously end of 2008 was when I sort of really started kind of motoring. And if I recall the story, you've briefly told me, but let's dig into it. You were sitting around with a bunch of girlfriends and you couldn't get your babies to sleep. Yeah, well, it was, it was a little, a little bit more than that, but yeah. So I, because I um, had a, a condition while I was pregnant, where I was in a wheelchair um, so what happened was when, once I was up and running again, literally up and walking. Uh, so I had Holly in the October and I start, I was able to walk again in the December, uh, sorry, the January of 2008. And then I started walking with the stroller a lot or pram as we call it in England. And I was so excited to be walking around that I was like out there walking all the time. And I think I probably walked, I mean, we walk a lot more in the UK, I think, than people, some people in the States do. Cause in the States, obviously the distances are longer and people tend to use their cars. Um, but we, we tend to walk quite a lot of places depending on where we come, where we live. Um, and, um, so I was walking with the pram all the time, like through all sorts of weather as well. So it was, you know, cold, hot, uh, spring, rain, etc., etc. And as Holly got a bit older, she used to sleep quite well in the pram. 
Um, and then as she got older, she got more interested in life generally and then became much more nosy and so didn't want to go to sleep. So then I did what a lot of people do, like we put muslins when it's like a spring day. When it was a freezing cold day, I would end up taking my coat off and like basically put it over the pram and then I'd be freezing and the coat would fall off, get covered in mud as the stroller went over it, etc., etc. And then I was sitting there with a whole group of friends in this uh, lunch that we were having and everyone had their stroller and every person had their baby and then we'd all given them their various bits of food etc you know I think they were probably all about sort of eight nine months something like that and then everyone did exactly the same thing everyone was putting a muslin over a blanket a cardigan uh you know whatever over the pram just to get the little so-and-sos to go to sleep so that we could actually have a conversation and, and actually have some lunch and um so that and I just thought surely there must be another way like surely there must be the equivalent of like a blackout blind that's for the nursery but that we could take out and about with us in a portable way and that was literally the beginning of the of the idea like in, in and, and I asked my friends at the time they were like oh yeah it sounds great <laughs> well and it it is obviously great because that idea you have now grown into a global brand Yes. Um, so the so the business is called Snooze Shade because I like names that say what they do on the tin, as we have an expression over here. I don't know if you have it in the States as well, but it's like it says what it does. So it's snooze. It helps babies snooze and it shades from the sun. It also shades from like wind chill, etc. And I want to, I love like practical names. Um, but interestingly, one of the things I always, I always mention about is when you're choosing a brand name, you do need to also look outside of your own parameters um, because I was thinking about calling it buggy blind because uh, it was a blind, as I was saying, for the buggy. But in some cultures and countries, there is no word for a blind of windows. There's only blind as in you can't see. Um, so that can have like a negative like connotation. Um, and there is sometimes no word for buggy, etc. So I went with snooze shade because... Basically, the snooze wasn't really sort of something that would translate badly and shade pretty much every like, language in the world has a word for some sort of shade. So, so it is something I always say to people, like, make sure you choose your brand name carefully. I love this. So while you were coming up this concept, you were a sleep deprived mom, you thought, hey, I can't use buggy blind because when I sell in all these other countries, I want them to understand exactly what my product's going to do. So you were thinking really big. Oh, from... I, I'm, I'm always go big or go home. You know, <laughs> you <Yes>. know that. <laughs> I do know that. I love that. I love it. Okay. So now the business is booming and you have a young kid. What was that like as Holly's mom and now having this business that was also, you know, taking on its own life like a second child would? Yeah, it was a living hell, if I'm honest. So um, I, I, and I mean, the other thing also that there was other stuff going on in the background, like I was actually going through IVF again. I went through two rounds of IVF in the first like seven or eight months of running the business, etc. Um, and uh, I went into production on this product, which hadn't actually existed before. Um, and for some mad reason, and again, I would not suggest people do what I did. Um, I decided to order 10,000 units. Um, and uh, I based that, I did have some numbers upon which I based that, which was that there are about three quarters of a million babies born every year in the UK. And I thought, hey, I'm sure I'll be able to do like 1%, which would be seven and a half thousand. And then I got a slightly better price from the factory if I bought 10,000. So I just thought, hey, in for a penny, in for a pound. So um, I rather recklessly, I think now, I don't think I would recommend people necessarily do that like how I did it. Uh, but I bought 10,000 units of a product that had never existed before and then and went into like full scale production. And then uh, I went to a trade show uh, because in those days, Amazon was not the power that it is now. Um, and online was very underdeveloped because remember this is like when I was at the trade show, it was October, 2009. And then I um, met up with a variety of big box retailers um, and um, actually they were interested in the concept, which is why I went to a trade show because I wanted people to, who actually were selling to customers, my potential customer, because if they'd all turned around and said, hey, this idea is completely crap, then I would have at least have like not wasted too much time and energy, et cetera. I only, put, I only pressed the button on production after I'd been to the trade show and got the feedback. And also I made a few product tweaks, changed the price, you know, did a whole lot of stuff that I, which I picked up from having done the trade show and sort of chatted to other people, et cetera. Um, and then went into full scale production and then started shipping products into the UK in the February of 2010. 
Uh, then there was a, a huge volcano, a volcanic eruption um, in Iceland uh, in the March, February, March of 2010, which then meant we had no planes coming in. So uh, freight costs, everyone complains about COVID freight costs. They tripled literally like overnight. And I'm still flying shit in because <laughs> I'm like, you know what? I can still make money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to, I've always, my attitude is always, as long as there's a profit involved, I'll sell it. If I'm not making profit, I'm not doing it. Um, so and I did and I carried on and I had orders and I had commitments to quite big retailers. Um, and, uh, so I was like, well, I've got to get them their, their product. Even if I do lose money, I'll have to consider it a marketing cost, you know? Um, and, uh, and anyway, I did it, I got it in, started selling and yeah, we, I sold out the first 10,000 units by about September, I think of the first year having launched in the March. You're listening to the fearless sellers, the women of Amazon podcast. If you like what you're hearing, click the subscribe button. We have new content coming out all the time and you don't want to miss out. And that's incredible. So that's proof of your product. So you were going through what you called hell. You had Holly, you were doing IVF, you had volcanoes erupting, slowing down your shipments. What kept you going? Um, <laughs> I think... <laughs> Uh, anyone, as you, you know me, uh, I think most people say I've, I've got quite, I'm quite resilient. Um, and uh, I think uh, I had a real belief in what I was doing and I really believed in my product and I really believed that it was going to make a difference to people. Um, and the feedback I started getting, I mean, I know Amazon sellers are normally very obsessed with getting reviews, but actually when you're doing something like that, the reviews are important not only in terms of like the positive stuff, but also the negative, because you want to know well, like, what's working, what's not working, what do I need to tweak, what what do I need to change? Um, but overall, the the the, um, the feedback was hugely positive. Like this was a product that people needed, um, and so you know, even I mean, I met I met a lady the other day. I was on the tube uh, in London, and uh, she had a pram, and I could see a snooze shade in her bottom um, of her buggy. And I just went around and went, oh, hi there, you know, oh, is that, I said, how are you getting on with snoo shade? And she looked at me and she was, she was obviously like, well, hang on a minute, this woman's like clearly not of child rearing age and she hasn't got a baby with her. And I was like, I said, I invented it. And she's like, oh my God, like this sort of thing. And I was like, yeah. And, and she, I said, was well, it help? And she's like, oh my God, it's brilliant. All my friends have got one. The world needs this product sort of thing. And I was like, oh, great. And she was like, oh, you're not, have you like sold the business? I said, no, I still run it from home. I mean, this is my kitchen, you know, behind, behind me. Um, I said, I still run it from home. It's still me. And she's like, oh, wow. I, uh, I thought, you know, you'd like be sitting on a beach somewhere. I said, well, I do that as well. <laughs> Occasionally. I said, but, you know, it is actually quite a small business. It just looks maybe a little bit larger than, than, than it is. I love that. Yeah. And there is that outside looking in like, hey, that I have your product. Your business is going so well. You must be on the beach and sold it. And Absolutely. Uh, as you and I have talked, like you actually love running snoo shade. You're an inventor. It's a big part of who you are and you want to continue to run it. Well, I mean, that's where I probably am a little bit different from, as I always say, from the sort of archetypal Amazon seller, because having just spent a weekend in London with like three days solid of like um, of various events, networking events with other Amazon sellers, um, it's really interesting because I'm, I'm a bit of a, a sort of a, an, a unicorn in some ways in that I'm just very slightly odd in comparison to everyone else, because most people are focused on how do they maximize profit so that they can exit? Whereas I'm like, how do I maximize how much I can spend on myself so that I'm having a good time? <laughs> no, it's not that bad. But what I do is I do, what I do is I, I use the business to invest in myself, to learn more things. I also uh, pet, put money behind me for my pension. Um, you know, I, I do all, lots of practical stuff. Um, and I also probably employ more people than I might necessarily need if I was running it to the kind of truly like down to the, to, to the fine lines of a, of a pure Amazon selling business um, because of the fact I actually don't want the stress of, of that. And uh, I, I mean, my brand is now 12 years old and I'm looking ahead to, yeah, I'm, I mean, if I sell it, I, I get, obviously you can imagine I get offers to, I, I still get offers like through LinkedIn and emails every day about, about people wanting to buy the business. And you're right, it's kind of like a second child as well. So I would only want to hand it over to someone who I trusted. I wouldn't hand Holly over to some random stranger. So I'm not <laughs> handing like Snooshade over to some random stranger. But um, 
also the other side of it is is that um you know actually if i sell the business even in 10 years it's going to be a 22 year old business it's actually got its own value from the longevity versus the the value that we all place on like quick wins fast exit and then you know i also have seen a lot of my friends sell very big businesses like seven eight figure exits and then they're starting up a business all over again and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to do that again at the moment. So I, I'm like actually thinking I'm going to stick to what I'm doing. And then I might even start up another business as a side hustle. But I could do that at the same time as what I'm doing with my kind of bread and butter business and then do the 